Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production. Oh, now would you look at that in the in the water here? There's just uh, oh, I wish I could. Can I record the? I suppose if I d- did a long exposure, I record I could record the movement of these reeds in the in the water here. Let me get my first picture of the day. Just the oh, it's so serene. The reeds moving in the water. Let's get another one. Make sure I've got it for you. There we go. First picture of the day. The foreword. Let me uh, let me introduce you to somebody who's going to join you and I on our photo walks. Barney, come on. We're oh, straight in the nettles. He's had his summer cut. Uh, when was it? Tuesday or Wednesday? He's half the dog he was. <laughs> Honestly, when he came back, we thought we might rename him. He didn't look like our dog at all. I'll uh, try and remember to put a picture on the on the show page if you're interested. Yes, let me introduce you to somebody who's going to join you and I on our photo walks now and then. And I don't mean somebody who is the uh, the fruit of Sir Barkalot's loins, although he is already, Barney that is, getting rather jinxy, if you know what I mean. Nudge, nudge. He's, uh, he's going to need to get more than a little creative and a possibly a set of stepladders if he meets Hattie the German Shepherd again though. Very odd moment yesterday in the park. Anyway, this is a show about making pictures, not puppies. So uh, the somebody I am referring to is a voice. You see, Photography Daily has, now has, its own voice AI that, that can answer all those niggly photographic questions that I sometimes have when I'm out on these photo walks with you. Uh, like, oh, here we go, let's test it. Hey, Iris, what does mundane mean? Here's what I found on the internet about mundane. It means dull, everyday, ordinary, or just plain uninteresting. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I've struggled with this week's assignment set on Monday by Alex Kilby, who is, by the way, next to uh, Friday's photo walk guest. He asked us, spoiler alert now, apologies for this, to go and photograph something. And here's why I asked about the word mundane. He asked us to go and photograph something mundane, or the, uh, the everyday. Something that you might not necessarily think twice about usually. And I've spent my week um, tried to photograph something mundane enough. I mean, should mundane be just dull, or really dull, or very, very dull? What is the, the league table of mundaneness? I mean, the first thing I photographed on, uh, was it Wednesday? Yes, it was Wednesday, wasn't it? As the sun didn't just shine, uh, but burst through the blinds in the office, was the alarm keypad. I go to this keypad every single day. I mean, I turn the alarm on, I turn the alarm off. I turn the alarm on, I turn the alarm off. I turn the alarm, we get the idea, Neil. Um, but let's face it, this, this, um, this rather mundane habit or thing in my day, it can't be the pinnacle of, well, anything in terms of excitement, can it? It is, it is mundane. I mean, I don't start the day leaping out of bed thinking, oh, I can't wait to get down to the office so I can turn the alarm off. But, uh, but when I photographed it, with my iPhone, by the way, which is why it's a bit motion blurred, there's my excuse, I photographed it because the mundane item was made to be, wow, photographically so much more interesting by the, uh, let's get through the gates here, by the, by the wonderfully, uh, well, it was exciting lights or shafts of light bursting through the blinds. Which, uh, which made me think, well, it's not mundane at all. It's no longer mundane, is it? It's, uh, it's no longer the, the everyday. It's become photographically intriguing. So a bit of a sort of a study in light. So it does seem that there's gold there in that, that normality or normalcy of life. And I think today's guest, Alex Fredrickson, found total gold in, uh, in normality too and there's the, the oh that's a squeaky gate and as the best moments in photography prove just at the time you're, you're least expecting it gold happens you see for Alex the world was in a funk careful Neil um, she was wondering what on earth to make pictures of and then 
serendipity happens. Today on the photo walk. There were just no people to be found. So I jumped on the train and there was me and one young man in the carriage. And I dropped something on the floor. And as I bent down to pick it up, I looked under the seat and I saw these feet looking at me and I thought, oh, <laughs> look at that. Stories of life told by photographers. And today those stories come from Alex Fredrickson, Chris Burkhardt, Charlie Waite and Grant Scott and you. It's a unique, special kind of photography podcast made from the letters you send in, the thoughts you have and the words from our special inspirational guests. Whatever you photograph with, be it a mirrorless you've just swapped into at mpb.com from years of lugging heavier DSLRs around topical, as you're about to find out, a smartphone or the, the Omnivision OV6948. Very catchy, Neil. Pray, why is that so interesting? Well, it's the, the world's smallest camera that's the size of a grain of sand. No, whatever you shoot with, this is a show about how we feel when we make pictures, what it does for us and what it does for others. And in that 6.6 billion people on this planet can make a picture with something, there's a lot of us about to walk with on our photo walk today. In the mailbag and coming up, lowering your heart rate taking pictures, why time disappears, getting up early to literally be or take pictures of the early bird, sound recording your street portrait scissors. What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you feel when you make pictures? In praise of the humble sketchbook picture and, of course, self-publishing. So shall we walk then? Checklist out. Coffee and Garibaldi's packed. Check. Boots on and laced. Check. Walking trousers or shorts. Long socks for those who walk amongst the, the rattlesnakes. Check. Spare batteries. Check. Memory cards or spare film. Check. Earbuds in. Check. Lens caps off. Let's walk. Welcome to the photo walk indeed. And I'm very grateful to mpb.com, a company that uh, so generously shown their support in this project of our ours over well it's well over a year now isn't it are we coming up to two years what year are we in what month is it oh, are we out the pandemic uh, but they they support us in these these walks that we we make together making our photographic imprint and making our stories and uh, well our legacy as well really so thank you mpb.com they are the people to go to when you're buying and selling and trading used camera kit online uh, in the UK, the US and Europe. And I'm proud that they're a part of our story here because, uh, well, they help photographers like you and like me to, uh, to make and tell our stories. And I, I use them, as you know, myself. And actually, right now, they're going to come into their own, so they are, as I'm, uh, I'm in a kind of transition where I'm... Well, going back to Fujifilm for, for much of my work, and I'll tell you why. It turns out, who'd have thought it works this way, by the way, that I'm not getting younger. What? Are you sure that's the way it works, Neil? I've seen Indiana Jones. You just simply have to look for the fountain of youth, don't you? Or, or drink more coconut water. You see, Father Time popped up a few months back and decided to say to me, you have to imagine the deep voice now, with a slight bit of echo, Neil, young man... 20 professional photography years, your shoulders have, have borne the weight, so they have, of much heavy quality glass. It's time to reconsider how you punish your body as you enter the next 20 years. I recommend you visit mpb.com and look at restocking your bag with quality, but much lighter glass for your Fujifilm cameras and that X-H2 that you kept asking for. And you can start with a 56mm. Ah, oh, you see, Father Time even knows my, one of my favourite focal lengths. Come on, Barney, this way. So yes, if Father Time is having a word in your lug holes, you may want, like me, to think about mpb.com. And I'll link to them, of course, on the website. You will never have heard Father Time and uh, a sponsor in a natural link ever before in your life. Of that, I am sure. Right to your letters. And I'm, uh, I'm starting the show with uh, two other people who have been uh, swapping gear and reconsidering what's in their camera bags. Please, 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 by the way, do, do not think this is a show just about gear today. But let's address the elephant in the room, shall we? Many of us do get um, a little more excited than we probably care to, um, to admit when a box of UPS, other 
couriers are available, or DPD, other couriers are available, arrives at our door and we start unboxing. It's a major event. For me, a cup of tea and at least a packet of Garibaldi's. So let me start with a letter from Greg Picconi from New Jersey land, whose stunning pictures that he's been making on his photo walks will be on the show page today, which is uh, linked to in the, the app, of course. Uh, there we go. See it there? Capital letters. Show page. Or you can go to photographydaily.show and just visit today's episode, which is number 312. Right, Greg's letter. Greetings, Neil. This is Greg Picconi from New Jersey land. I've been enjoying Photography Daily for a couple of years now. After selling off my Canon gear, finally deciding I had to uh, trade the heavy load for a, a more compact kit. So the, uh, the design of the Fuji film, <laughs> this isn't the Fuji cast, no, uh, brought back fond memories of the days of the SLR film days, when cameras were cameras and not computers. Amen to that. Is it right, by the way, or did I, did I dream this? that a mobile phone has more computing power than the first rocket that flew men to the moon. Did I make that up? Did I see that on the Discovery Channel? Is it a Chinese whisper that isn't, uh, isn't entirely accurate? But by the by, about half hundred years ago, I had the pleasure to live in the UK, says Greg. My dad was in the USAF, stationed at RAF Lakenheath. I do know it from 67 to 1970. I heard you uh, heard you comment on growing up with uh, only three channels in the... Let's just get through the gate. This way, Barnes. Come on. Bark a lot. This way. There we go. Come through. Super. Yeah, I heard you comment on growing up with only three TV channels in the 1970s when you were a boy. Imagine, he says, being transplanted from the USA where we had loads of channels and programming ran all night long. You could say it was a bit of a shock. I dare say it was, Greg. And I do remember going to a small pub in Feltwell with my parents. The landlord and locals seemed to welcome us without hesitation. Or oh, I, <laughs> I don't know, Greg. They'd have been sizing you up, probably. We don't see many people like you around here. Oh, that's a terrible... In Hang on. What's, what's gone on with my impression? We don't get many people like you. I only seem able to do it when I'm saying get off my land. Suffice to say, they probably haven't seen many people like you in that pub you went to. We don't see many people like you around here. Quick, Alfred, prepare the sacrificial offering table. Oh, it was somewhere closer. During the winter, the senior gentlemen, wearing their tweed jackets and ties, would stand around the, the coal stove, warming their cold Guinnesses. Yeah, another very strange habit that I think we have in the UK. Even stranger was their passion for playing musical chairs and insisting that we join in. Greg, you sound like you were lucky to get out alive. This sounds like the TV show uh, League of Gentlemen. You can look that up. The surreal British horror sitcom. There's four words in a row that probably don't live together. <laughs> If you can have such a thing. Anyway, keep up the good work, says Greg. Here are some photographs made on my photo walks, which I will share on the show page today. Thank you for them. Terrific. Amazing. And uh, if I could teleport myself to your part of the world in New Jersey land, I'd be there making photo walks with you. And then uh, one from Peter Upton. And I was a little bit scared by this letter as it came with the introduction. Three words. I blame you. I wouldn't have been surprised if it had an exclamation mark next to it, but uh, it didn't. Hi, Neil. I've just... Oh, sounds ominous. I've just added another camera to my kit, and I entirely blame you. But it's OK, because you've helped me through a lot recently. Since the, uh, the end of February, we as a family have been going through a bit. Uh, but uh, through all of it, I've been able to put uh, on the podcast while driving or while washing up or at work and your words and your stories can relax me. Add in the great sound design where you include ambient sounds and it's almost like I'm out on a photo walk with you, uh, even when life leaves me no time for my own. So a big thank you from me. Can I just say, by the way, Peter, that uh, the sounds that you hear are the sounds that I hear. I am most definitely not in a studio, not that you were suggesting that, I know, but uh, for those that say, oh, sound design, does that mean that he... It's all a bit Hollywood. 
absolutely not it's me a microphone so bark a lot let me prove that barney come here oh he's really not interested what have you found what are you digging for hey i don't get how you don't hurt yourself when you when you stand against those nettles and do what you do so yeah i will look you can hear it in the background the geese in the background it's all happening real time honestly it is it's you and me and our walk anyway says peter when listening to the mindfulness episode i realize that i completely identify with the experience you have of your heart rate dropping as you look through the viewfinder yes we've talked about this haven't we and it really does even when i'm doing i know some people consider um wedding photography has a strange connotation for people doesn't it some some people have a st- <laughs> have um strange thoughts about weddings don't they what do you do for a, what do you do for a li- what do you do for a, a real living yes that's the question i often get at weddings is this is this, is this what you do isn't it your hobby uh, no it's, it's actually my job really anyway yes um i do find even at those events where i know some photographers find those kind of events quite stressful i mean it's that, that one-off thing isn't it but even then i find you know position myself looking through the viewfinder watching what's happening in front of me peter the heart rate begins to to lower i tell you it does so to the cameras oh the sticky subject to the cameras peter i picked up two with color rendition that's to die for but in typical photography daily style the picture i am attaching from my new purchase is in black and white i will still have to keep blaming you when my better half catches me looking at x pro and xh cameras in the months to come don't blame me for your gas peter (laughs) he says smiling that knowing smile i tell you what pete we'll cover for each other it was pete's idea it was neil's idea Oh, it was Pete's idea. It was near... We'll confuse them, Peter. Yeah. Uh, Apologies for the rambling mail and hope the attached picture makes up for it. I saw these feathers that somebody had stuck into the fence when I was picking my son up from Cubs and I grabbed a a quick shot on uh, the new camera, converted to black and white using the infrared preset in Lightroom. And here is the result. It's fantastic. I love it. I didn't know, by the way. I know I should know this, but just between... You and me, Peter. <laughs> I had no idea there was an infrared preset uh, or profile. Is it profile or preset? What did you say? Preset. Yes. I had no idea, Peter. And as for uh, and as for finding the feathers, just popped in a sort of randomly in a fence as you're walking along. What a strange find. Strange finds would be, I think, uh, a cracking um, assignment. I keep thinking I, I want to set an assignment, but the point is really that uh, the assignments are set by this, this wonderful esteemed guests. But already, uh, I mean, you've given me an, I- an idea for my own assignment one week on a Monday. That and something to do with sounds as well anyway. Right, you mentioned uh, mindfulness week. We've had more than one or two, but I'm, I'm going to play you some inspiration from our guest. Come out of there, Barn. Not in the canal, please. From our guest Chris Burkard in episode 296, which was called Suffering for Our Art, a shortcut to mindfulness, question mark. Here he is talking about his travels, surfing and photographing in sub-zero temperatures. Um, But the connection he has when he's in these truly cold places with his camera, uh, this inner peace that results from it, the sheer wonder of making pictures in an instant as well. Being at one with the environment and the camera. This is Chris Burkhardt. It's funny because my my whole, my you mentioned the TED talk, so I'll jump into that, but my whole, you know, shtick was basically like, if suffering is a shortcut to mindfulness, then I would consider myself a monk because I think <laughs> I've, I've tried to thrust myself into a lot of situations where that is the case. And I know that might seem like a masochistic approach, but it's really not. It's not about masochism at all. It's about finding that understanding that in those environments, you do become more mindful. You become more aware. You're more aware of your surroundings when they can kill you you're more aware of um you know the image when you have a limited time frame to make it happen to make it work there's there's a lot more that becomes top of mind when it is when you're thrust into the the here and now and i can't think of a better thing to thrust you into the here and now than harsh and inclement weather or in a hostile environment and i don't mean hostile like it's trying to harm you but i just mean hostile like when the moments are good 
They're so good. And you know, in that moment, that they last just a very, very little amount of time. And that's special to me. Chris Burkhardt. And um, of course, I'll link to Chris's episode in the, the show notes. Would you look at that? Look at the wingspan on that, Barnes. That's huge. I mean, the red kites that we have here are, are large. That's, what's that, an albatross? It's a, it's a pterodactyl, which reminds me, walking across, uh, what was it the other, the other night, walking across a field on the way back home with Sabarkalot, and there was a sign that said, uh, what was it? It was re- reptile, no, it can't be reptile repositioning. Reptile, oh, rep, reptile relocation, that was it. Reptile relocation, do not walk here. Um, there's nothing like the words reptile and relocation, along with do not walk here, uh, for my mind to go in absolute uh, free-fall imagination and go wild with the thoughts that, what do they mean? Do they mean that uh, get off my land has put velociraptors out or something? That's a way to keep people off your land, isn't it? They won't stay off my land, put velociraptors on there. That'll learn them. Right, letters. Um, this is what I... Well, <laughs> Now this is what I call. Well, it was a long. It was quite a long letter. I've had to edit slightly, and I hope uh, Matthias Vessa, and I hope I've said that right. Vessa, Vessa. I think so. Um, you'll you'll not mind that I've edited. I've edited slightly. Um, there's as much ground covered within this letter, and if you want to send in your thoughts and your stories about photography, and of course your pictures as well as you make your photo walks, then do what Matthias has done, please, and send them to studio at photographydaily.show. Studio at photographydaily.show. Um, so I think you'll need a swig of coffee and maybe uh, break out a couple of maybe three Garibaldis for this one. Um, hello, Neil. First of all. Here is the report that you were asking for a few episodes back regarding the apparent disappearance of time. Yes, I was, wasn't I? I was wondering how these weeks come around so quickly. How does all this time disappear in our lives? Barney, not in there. Oh, straight back in the water. This way. No, this way. That's too deep. Come on. That's for dogs much larger than you. Um, So, number one. I spend a lot of time, he says, looking for reading glasses. So number one is unintended relocation of glasses. About 10 minutes a day at least. Lost looking for reading glasses. I'm the same. I tell you what, Matthias. Uh, in, our, in our house, the joke is, oh, where's my glasses? That's the impression that the boys do of me. And Sam, actually. Where's my glasses? I'm surprised they haven't made me a T-shirt. Where's my glasses? Because that's what you hear every single time we go to the cinema. Where's my glasses? Number two, traffic, he says. From somewhere around, well, 30 minutes to the complete Lord of the Rings director's cut, including commentary, bloopers and behind-the-scenes documentary kind of length time. Yes, I know what you mean. Number three, scrolling Reddit. This is a huge time factor. I lose at least 20 minutes a day when sorting and scrolling. Did you know, by the way... There we are. Here's a, here's a fact to share. Uh, as an average across two years, we will scroll with our fingers, stand by, 147 miles. <laughs> 147 miles. But there's, uh, there's more I've been uh, wanting to, to talk to you about. Sounds like I'm in trouble. Is it like the one with the kit just a moment ago with Peter? I started listening to your podcast a few weeks ago after a long search for a photography related podcast that simply inspires me to to pick up my camera and get out i most enjoy the photo walk episodes Uh, that's right up my alley along which the alley that is you will find my very own imposter syndrome oh no a while ago i started creating photography vlogs with the intention to create videos I couldn't find in my my mother tongue, which is German. And uh, while I haven't uh, really claimed a huge following, I've uh, I've had a reasonable amount of success. And what matters to me most is I'm having fun creating these videos. There's a bit of echo here because we're going under a bridge. Come on, Barney, should we do it together? (laughs) Don't look that impressed, will you? I also set up my own uh, web shop just to see what happens. A highly saturated market with little demand, as we know. I sold a a few 
so far and gladly I don't rely on those sales but every now and then I look at it all and think to myself who do I think I am oh there's the imposter syndrome I wonder whether it would be the filmmaking and the and the web shop well you are who you are Mateus straight away uh, the good thing uh, is I'm doing it he says I just wanted to try it I bought the domain and hosting service for two years and whether this was me overestimating the amount of interest I could raise or if I'll completely sell out my shop. Well, that remains to be seen. Yes, it does. And it doesn't matter. You're doing it. You're trying it. You're having a go. And that's the most important thing, isn't it? And then I just want to share with you two photos I've taken recently on the beautiful small island of Baltram, which uh, I had to check here because my my geography knowledge of Germany isn't fantastic. I tend to base it completely around where my uncle lives. If it's close or not close to Munich, that is. Yeah, sharing two photographs, which I wouldn't have gotten had I uh, chosen to sleep instead of getting up early on a Sunday morning, as much as six in the morning counts as early amongst landscape photographers. It probably isn't, is it, if we were, if we were being honest? It's uh, sort of more like 3.34 in the morning, isn't it, for landscape photographers? They're literally sleeping with one eye open, aren't they? Is that light? Is there a slither of light coming in? Quick, everybody up. Hoof up the top of that hill there. It had been a morning for which I planned to sleep in, or at least until breakfast, and yet I woke up naturally at around about six in the morning. A look out of the window showed me what nature has to offer. Beautiful morning fog in between the dunes, yes. Oh, those foggy shots. Now, you know me with fog and mist. It's, uh, it's rather elusive to me. I'm plan this winter, I'm planning to get fog and mist. The first image is the, uh, the camp I spent most of my summers at when I was growing up. And today, um, well, it's nostalgic, this, isn't it? My wife and I travel there twice a year, if possible, to set up tents and take care of what's to fix. Giving back, really. In the photo, morning fog in the dunes, those buildings in the background are a beautiful sight, and they really are. You have to go to the show page today. And the second photo is, well, basically the same view, but with uh, a locally common bird that I can't find the name of in the foreground. It's calling. Now, I know who can solve this mystery for us. It's our own Andrew Hardacre. Yes. Well, maybe some more people besides. But Andrew, I know, will, will know. The moment he looks at your picture on the show page, he will know. And Andrew, I'm tasking you to leave a note in the, uh, in the show notes. There we go. <laughs> Homework set. Um, it's a kind of annoying sound. See, we don't have the sound. That's when, see, that's when you need to get your recorder out and record the sound of the bird as well. I know you'll all be fingers and thumbs as you try to get different bits of kit doing different things. But, uh, yeah, we could have had the sound and the picture. Uh, it's a kind of an annoying sound, which is uh, why everybody remembers this particular bird and the call. I'm happy I could sneak up on it and capture this, this brief moment as the bird would flee once I pressed the shutter button. If you take a close look, and I have, uh, you can even see the air the bird's exhaling. It's like, it's like the bird is whistling. I'm really proud of the pictures, and that's why I decided to share them with you. And I'm so pleased you did. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful when you send your your pictures in for this, this programme. Wherever you're, you're walking, wherever you live, um, it's fantastic. I, I know I call it a geographic blog, but that's honestly how it, uh, how it feels sometimes. So thank you so much for, for sending those, those pictures in, and they will be on the, the show page today. Have a wonderful day, he says, and keep on creating this wonderful podcast. You're very kind, very generous. Um, and I'll, I'll also remember to put a link to your YouTube channel since you mention it. No reason, by the way, for you to feel that uh, imposter syndrome. Although it's almost uh, pointless saying that to creatives, isn't it? Because it's, it's a sort of occupational hazard of who we are and what we do. It's something we all share to one degree, uh, either lesser or greater than, than another. Right. Are you ready for my guest this week? Yes, we are, Neil. OK. Well, it is um, Alex Frederickson this week, who we've talked about and, of course, read mails from on this show before. But I really wanted to, um, this particular story, what she's going to talk about today, record a bit more, a bit more detail for you, um, a bit more depth on, on a story that we've, we've mentioned before uh, about the, the feet under the seat 
uh, because I think it's a triumph out of adversity story um, that's drawn me to this this tale. And really, this is for anybody who has a, a serendipitous moment and thinks, hmm, I think I've got a bit of an idea here, a sort of light bulb moment. And maybe, maybe just like Matthias in the letter a moment ago, I can sell some prints or make some videos or, in Alex's case, create her first photography book. So a bit of background. Alex lives in, in Austria, as you'll hear, which, for context, has some of, the, uh, some of the sharpest, harshest and most, I think, unfortunate, strong rules about street photography. In essence, you just can't do it. And do you know what? I maintain that uh, Austria's history books in generations to come, this particular period anyway, will have huge gaps when it comes to just seeing what was happening at this time from talented street photographers. I suppose there'll be a sort of a whole generation missed. Um, anyway, now, in between the, the story being told today, um, we're going to have some excerpts from her book and her story, which are read by my wife, actually. After all, we did meet in radio. So uh, thank you, Sam, for reading the excerpts that are within the book. So this is Alex Fredrickson telling uh, her story about publishing her first book, a book that is called Feet Under the Seat. Alex, Feet Under the Seat. Stories from life told by feet on a train. Brilliant. It's the book yeah. and it's out. But it's been a journey, if you pardon the, uh, <laughs> the pun, to get there and we're going to talk about that but tell me about the book tell me for for those that don't know about your project what is it about it started on the 1st of january 2021 the whole world virtually was in lockdown mm. and i live in a ski resort in austria and i decided on that day that i was going to try to take one photograph every day that i enjoyed not necessarily that it was a good photograph but that i enjoyed now i'm not a landscape photographer people are my thing and you can imagine in a place that's locked down in the middle of winter with only snow everywhere no. there were just no people to be found so i jumped on the train and there was me and one young man in the carriage and i dropped something on the floor and as I bent down to pick it up, I looked under the seat and I saw these feet looking at me and I thought, oh, <laughs> look at that. And it's actually one of the first pictures that I took at all of feet. So I took the photograph and I actually giggled <laughs> in a time when the whole world was depressed. I was depressed. Everybody was absolutely fed up. I laughed and I thought... This is so quirky. I'm keeping this picture. So it's fair to say that this idea developed into the project we're talking about uh, after that very quickly, isn't it? Yeah, you know, the next day I rode at going to work time, so half past seven. And this carriage, there were, there were, there were maybe four people in it. I was so excited because <laughs> there were four people in the carriage. I'm looking around. You know, usually when you're in a train, you sit and you look out of the window or you play with your phone or you do anything. You think about where you're going. Mm. You do anything but look at the people who are sharing your space. And from the first moment, I tuned in instead of out. And I was watching all these four people. And I'm looking down at what do they have on their feet? Can I glean anything from what they're wearing, from how they're sitting, from their posture, from anything about them? And then I moved to the seat behind them every time and just took wow. a surreptitious photo. And every time I looked at it and I was I was I was like a little kid at Christmas. It was like, oh, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> and, and actually, um, it doesn't take long for you to it's not just the pictures now. It's, it doesn't take long for you to start to tune into their conversation, too is it yeah as time as time started to go on i met shoppers and i met older people who were who had just been to the supermarket and there's one particularly hilarious um conversation between an old couple on the train yeah. luckily for me masks meant that a lot of people had to shout if that would have been a normal time and a normal conversation, I would have missed all of this, Neil. Well, we, we've pieced together some excerpt readings from the book, and I, I know you started to talk with people as well as uh, eavesdrop into their conversations. Uh, do, does any, do any uh, particular uh, moments come to mind when you, when you think about the people you spoke with? There was a lady who was, she, she works as a waitress, and I know her, and I asked her how she was coping 
with not not being allowed to go to work and she said this is the first time in 30 years in my in my career in hospitality that I've been able to ski when I like <laughs> play with my grandkids when I like because their mum goes to work and I mind them we talked about all these kinds of things and what happened with her I was watching her feet under the seat before I actually realised who it was and every time we hit a bump the feet lifted <laughs> off the ground and she laughed <laughs> so I laughed and then I thought I've got to know who this is so I looked between the seats and I saw her and then that's when we started to talk yeah so every story in the book has something attached that actually happened. So it was either me having a conversation with this person or something that happened that I observed. So there may, there may not have been any contact, but it was something that I observed about this particular person and their situation. Did, did anybody ask you, what are you doing? Why are you photographing my feet? No, because it, it's um, this is where the problem comes in here, Neil. This is because this is probably classified as street photography, which is not allowed in Austria. No, I know. Yeah. So this was all done very, very, very secretively. Yeah. And this is this is again where the beauty of this camera comes in. I could just pretend I was just looking at flicking through the images that I'd taken. Nobody knew what I was doing. Yeah. Um, and and I became really, really good at it. So I'm I'm prob I'm I'm definitely like a ninja now. I'm so <laughs> stealthy you would not believe i can do this on the bus with sitting somebody sitting straight opposite me and they would have no clue that i was taking their photograph well it leads me to wonder what will happen if somebody sees their feet and their shoes and their socks yeah if it would have been if it would have been just the just the feet with no stories attached hmm. then i could have i could have maybe argued how can you prove that that's you yeah but because of the story, it's the context yeah. of that of that image with that story, and they know that their connection of, with me. So if they read the book or see the book, then they're going to know is, is that me? And then they read the story. Yeah, that's definitely me because I remember that conversation with that with that person. Yeah. So, what What will happen if if they do? Worst case scenario, I could get taken to court. <laughs> but that's unlikely. I would have thought. <laughs> Austrian people are really funny about this. Are they? It's really if you. I mean, you know that I also sh I also take ICM photographs, and if people see me on the street just wiggling my camera, but but they are somewhere in the vicinity of that of that range. Mm then I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, what are you doing? Why are you taking my... And I'm saying, I'm not taking your photograph. Look, and I show them the back of the screen and it's completely, you know, ICMI's version of... And they're really, really aggressive. Everybody knows their rights here. If I was doing this maybe in Salzburg or in Vienna, it would be the, the attitude would be very different. But we, we, we're in the country here where people are much more suspicious about people's motives. Interesting. I'm on the train and I'm tired. It's early evening and I've ridden all the way back to the end of the line and three quarters of the way back. It's too warm and I'm ready to get off and get some fresh air. I'm shooting under the seat, alert to what might be happening behind me, but in no way anticipating what is about to happen right in front of me. Just as I'm moving my focus point around, the feet move and a heartbeat later the owner is squatted on the floor, looking for something he seems to think he's dropped. And suddenly he's looking right at me. We are eyeball to eyeball. Um, one of my favourite, favourite, favourite projects ever as a narrative, as stories, as poetry sometimes, was Chicken Soup for the Soul. I don't know whether you know of that series. And it seems to me, uh, and some of the feedback that I've read, is that people feel that about your stories. Well, I think I think the thing is about, about, the, about the stories is that I try to tell it from how I felt and also because of the pandemic, because of the time that it was taken in, or that this book was actually t took place, I really believe that if you look at some of the pictures and you and you read some of the stories, it could have been a little ski resort in Austria. It could have been San Diego, California. Yeah. It could have been Sydney, Australia. It could have been Manchester, UK. It could have been absolutely anywhere. People were feeling the same. Yeah. And a lot of people, especially young people, they look the same, don't they, with their with their with what they wear. So it would be very, very hard to actually pin down to say that definitely took place in Austria. We, we, we were one at that time, weren't we? Mm. Under the under the skin and under the seat as well. The, the books, I want to get on to how the books came about. You had um, a problem that I hadn't considered. Uh, I got some notes from you and I was, I thought, of course, the price of paper has gone up during this time. And that was one thing that affected you. Tell me about how you, you chose who you were going to print it through and why and bringing this thing to life as a, as a 
tangible thing? Well, what happened was after I started to accumulate a few images, I shared them on in various groups on Facebook. And a lot of people were saying, this is really so different to anything that I've ever seen before. And it wasn't something that I ever really considered making a book out of it. But as as the posts and the stories grew in popularity, people actually started saying to me, this just has to be a book because it's about the pandemic, but it's not. It's about life because some of the stories are not about the pandemic. They're just about normal, normal interactions between people. But the way that they come together are so interesting, so unique, so quirky. You've got to turn this into a collection, into a book. And I kind of thought, well, I've never done this before, but yeah, why not? Let's let's do it. And that's where I can actually tell you that that's where the, the divide came kind of in my mind, because Prior to that, it was just me having an absolutely wonderful time interacting with all these wonderful, lovely people who were managing to get by day to day despite what was going on yeah. and live despite what was going on or, or be sad or be happy or be absolutely desperate in some cases. I watch him get on, the lean, serious looking, bespeckled young man with his briefcase. He sits diagonally opposite me plants one foot firmly on the ground and rests the other atop his bent knee, showing me his soul. I watch as he brings out his earphones and puts his bag on the floor. A few minutes later, I see his foot begin to move to music, only he can hear, and then he's bouncing the heel of his other foot off the floor too. I see the girl in front of him turning around and guess he must be humming or singing. She catches my eye and I see laughter there. A moment later, I see his hand moving through the air to the music and I'm sure that if I could see his head, he'd be moving that too. Alex Frederickson returns for part two shortly, uh, which is the publishing part. So if you're wondering, if you're thinking, oh, this story sounds intriguing, I I've got a book in me, how do I even begin to go about the publishing part? Well, we, we touch on that in part two. Uh, like many indie podcasters around this wonderful planet of ours, we have a a Patreon page where some very special friends help support this show for the price of a cup of high street coffee or a, a roll of my favourite my favourite stock HP5 black and white film a month. Now, if you're not fond of uh, monthlies, you can now join us annually and uh, there's a small discount for doing so as well. Go to the, the, the website page, all the W's, photographydaily.show and in the top right-hand corner, although very soon it's just going to be in the middle, there'll be a support the show yellowy-orangey box. <laughs> we don't need to go through the colour again, do we? Uh, our Patreon friends help support the time that it takes to make and sustain these shows, which now take three production days a week, along with time spent on the website and, and the, uh, the show notes and the, the community features. And to say thank you... I make an additional diary of a photographer-styled show each week called More, which you can only hear on the Patreon webpage or the, the app, the wonderful app on your smartphone. And midweek we have replay as well, a chance to hear the special guests that we talk to, Unplugged. Plus we meet each month on Zoom where we share stories and pictures, some of which you'll find on the, the website on the picture post tab. Now there are around about, I say around about, because I haven't counted, but I know there are 100 plus extra shows and bits to listen to or read. And I thought you might like to hear just a smidge of what we were talking about last weekend or more. Now, I went on a, on a um, street portraiture uh, course, or workshop really, with uh, Gabrielle Matola a couple of Sundays ago. And um, it was all, well, it was about confidence mainly. And yeah, I know you won't believe this, but uh, I do have um, a slight issue with, with confidence when it comes to street portraits, that is. Not, not portraits when I'm working professionally, but street portraits. When you challenge yourself and think, oh, I'm going to make some street portraits today. The confidence of being able to ask somebody to do that. So I went on Gabrielle's course, and we talked about that on the, on the show a couple of weeks ago as well, uh, with Gabrielle herself. And... Um, I, I made a programme about it following that, which is on the Moore channel. It was last Saturday's Moore show, and you'll see the pictures that I made, uh, the description 
um, well, it's a, a further radio show. I, I describe going through the process and what I felt. And then, and then, I met this truly incredible character right towards the end of the day, uh, who I made some photographs of and then um, whipped out my, my recorder, my audio recorder. And although I wasn't going to do this, I was going to concentrate on the pictures, I found myself recording his story. And I do think it's such a, a powerful way to, to tell stories, um, to have that extra, that extra dimension, if you like. This is Joseph Marinus, who is a street poet, and a snippet of what I recorded with him, which has inspired me to record more conversations as I make pictures. I'm going to put my poem down very carefully here. Just tilt your head a bit, then chin down a bit. Yeah, so this is Ernest. Marvellous. It's a wonderful story, actually. Um, so what happened was I met this beautiful girl from Israel. And she was one of these rare people who've got time to sit down. She squatted down, sat down and stayed a long time. I'm telling her poems and she's listening, very appreciative. So this girl said to me in the end, she said, you know, it'd be wonderful if you wrote a poem for my sister. So she said, my sister is a great singer. She had a terrible car crash and was dead, and practically dead. The doctor said, give up hope, she won't come back. Strong woman, she did come back. So she's come back and now she was so restored that she'd begun her singing career. So that was the poem, the That's song. The poem. Now I sent the song, she left an email. So I sent it to her, yeah. but I never got a reply. So I don't know whether the email you know, got lost in cyberspace or her mind had moved on to other things and she'd forgotten. But anyway, I did fulfill the commission yeah. and sent the poem by email to Israel and I know not what happened to it. It's a, um, it's a mystery to you oh, as well. Oh, this wow. poem is there yeah. on the magic carpet as a uh, trip. Well, I'm going to make my trip now and read this on my way home. Walk on, stranger. Thank you. And that's Joseph Marinus. And you can, uh, well, you can hear my full account on learning to find confidence once again in street portraiture on The More Show from last weekend. More number 95, a 40 minutes extra show titled... Uh, uh, can I take your picture? Question mark. Um, there's also an extra Zoom invite for an evening's training, a two-hour Zoom workshop on Wednesday, July the 6th at 7 p.m., which is completely free, of course, for our patrons to attend. We're going to be talking about making audio stories to go with your still images. We'll also be talking about how you can then move those images with sound onto Instagram. So, yes, that's to come in a few weeks' time. Right. A letter which says everything about the mindfulness of making pictures, and there seems to have been a sub-theme of that today, doesn't there? Uh, this is from Graham Filden, and of course I'll include Graham's pictures on the show page today. Graham says, Whilst I've um, always had an interest in photography, it was when I started walking and spending more time outdoors and in nature for stress relief, exercise and grounding that my interest in photography increased as I started to take my camera with me on my walks. Having the camera with me encouraged me to take more notice of my, my surroundings as I walked, and as I looked through the viewfinder, I noticed that my mind stopped racing, and it became totally focused on the scene in front of me and not thinking about anything else. My camera, a Leica one, you lucky thing you, is totally manual and needs me to, to set the exposure and the focus manually, which also helps to slow me down and immerse me in the, the picture-making process. And I found this process to be really quite meditative, slowing down, detaching from my problems to focus on the subject, the process of taking a photograph of a, of a landscape or a woodland scene, uh, my favorite subjects. After doing this for a few days, I started to wonder if I could take this photographic meditation a step further. And so I decided to take my tripod with me. Now, for all those that have tripods, and I have, I'm about to do, funnily enough, a review. A review, Neil, that sounds like kit. Yes, it is, unashamedly. But yes, for all those that have tripods, that think, oh, I just want to travel light. I've started taking a tripod with me now and then. So Graham's letter was of great interest to me for that reason. Now, this was a, a, a light bulb moment 
With a camera on the tripod, he says, I can now step back and think even more about the photograph I'm about to take. How should the picture be composed? What should be included? And this is important, actually. What should be excluded from the photograph? What should be the final image? What will the final print look like? What will it feel like? What will I feel like? And this is also where the meditation kicks in. As I found my photos and compositions are better when having the camera set up, I step back and I look at the scene as well that's in front of me and I tune into my senses. What can I hear? What can I smell? Do I feel warm or cool? Can I feel a breeze on my skin? What is my breathing like? What emotions am I feeling when I'm looking at the scene? Goodness gracious, Graham. I tell you what, you should be setting an assignment because uh, I'm thinking this is perfect. If you take a notepad out, make a picture and note all those things down, that would be fantastic for an assignment. Note to self. Call up, Graham. Are you ready, Graham? As, um, as essentially a yogi, taking pictures in this way has become a mini and sometimes full meditation, says Graham, as I shut down my racing mind and detach from my thoughts and problems to immerse myself in the surroundings. I can also think about gratitude as I appreciate the beauty and what nature has created for me to photograph. This is all great, he says, for my mental health. But taking this approach has also resulted in much better compositions and much better photographs. Your mind and photography, he says, will appreciate it. Following this practice, I've found I take less but better photos and I've also had the benefit of a mini meditation. And those are the words from Graham Fielden, whose Insta I shall link to on the show page today. And I, I'm not sure I can add anything to that in terms of, well, I'm just going to agree wholeheartedly, Graham, really. I think you've said it all. You really have. Thank you so much for that email. And uh, I mean it, by the way. I think that's a, that would be a cracking assignment. Noticing, stopping and noticing and noting down all those experiences, all those feelings that you've, you've described. And, uh, well, I suppose while we're talking meditation and meditative photographs and being within the landscape, would you like to hear some more inspiration from a former guest? Yes, please, Neil. OK, let's go back to episode 278 to hear some inspiration from the British landscape photographer Charlie Waite who has the most incredible calming nature about his work and his approach to a, to a life spent making pictures. Many of my distinguished chums um, will find themselves thinking, I need, I just need to commune. Yeah. I need to go out and commune. And my cameras, the, the supportive, I keep using the word conduit, to, to assist me to do that. And I, I just think it's just, I don't, I think many people haven't fully grasped it. I really, I really do. And, and so I think in the US, there is much more credit given to photography and what, the, what it's about. If you, uh, it's pretty shameful. You add up the number of um, photographic galleries who will, who will uh, show landscape photographs in the UK. It's, it's shameful. They're hardly, they're not enough. I think there's probably, Forgive me if I haven't got this quite right, but I, I think there's probably not more than maybe a dozen. If, if that in London, and some cities don't have any at all, but, and yet most US cities will have a, a dedicated gallery to, to photography. That's Charlie Waite. Come on, Barney, come here. He's been so good today. You're very patient with me, because sometimes I stop and I, I want to sort of mark my script a bit. The other day, somebody bought him some, uh, what were they, tuna and cheese biscuits, honestly. Uh, he turned his nose up straight away. Come here, let the cyclist go past. Have another one, here we go, there we go, good boy, good boy. Good boy, left the cyclist alone as well. Well, when you're giving me treats. Yeah, the other day, tuna, tuna and cheese biscuits. I mean, would you? And then later on she said to us, did he like his tuna and cheese biscuits? Which we'd thrown in the bin. Oh yeah, he loved them, adored them. Oh, I must buy some more. Which is, um, there we go kids. There's a reason why you should always be honest. Right, 365s. Thank you for the 365s that you've been sending in. We have a community 365 feature. One picture every single day. I have missed a few over the last couple of weeks. I know. Note to self, bad boy. Uh, but stuff's been, uh, there's been quite a lot on the plate of late. So that just, well, all it does is it, 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 it extends the 365 by a couple of days. And I've given myself a must-do-better mark 
in the exercise book. But yes, the 365 feature is really for you. If um, you've ever wanted to do a 365, but you thought, oh, I'm not sure I can do this every single day, you can join in our community one. Send your pictures, 2,000 pixels wide, please, to studio at photographydaily.show. Ian Stronghill, who is picture number 292. Fantastic. Stunning, stunning. And one more for luck. Stunning. And another one. Stunning picture of a lonesome tree in the mist. Uh, a portrait orientated picture that really draws your eyes along it really does along the path and up into the uh, the tree it's called the image is called morning light ian sent some words into accompany his picture which is truly beautiful it really is and it starts with a quote from ansel adams which could well have been a worthy contender for the postscript today sometimes i do get to places just when god's ready to have somebody click the shutter by Ansel Adams. Yes, well, I, I think he's being suitably modest there. Um, I think, Ansel Adams, you made those pictures as well. It was a partnership, I think, with God's Light. So, writes Ian, therein lies the essence of a good landscape photograph. On the morning I made this particular picture, I was in the right place at the right time to witness the light and ground fog coming together at one of my favourite trees. Well, that's as may be, but you still had to make the photograph, and it is fabulous. Uh, remember, if you're sending in your pictures for 365, or indeed your stories for the, uh, for the show in general, do, do please remember to send in your Instagram link or your website link or Flickr link um, every single time. I know... <laughs> I know I know some of yours. I've been to your, your Instagrams and I, I comment or I, I leave likes, etc. But it, it really just helps me. Uh, so I'm uploading them if you can send. When you send your email in, just remember to, to pop that on the bottom and send them into studio at photographydaily.show. We're back with Alex Fredrickson soon. First up, though, Bob Demers. Where have you been, Bob, in my life for a month or so? I've missed you. You stop sending Christmas cards, you never... No, slightly over the top. Yes, I, I think it probably is. Hi, Neil, says Bob. First, apologies. Or perhaps an excuse, if I get sentimental. But two cervezas down after a long day on location. He's a cinematographer, he's Bob. And a delightful photo walk in a strange town has, has got me cogitating on the why of photography. Uh, do we need to buckle in, Bob? Stand by at the bar. If Bob orders a third, <laughs> uh, we could be in all night. Quick, close the shutters. Hide the, bu hide the bar nuts. Uh, well, says Bob, I still really don't know why, but I do appreciate your sketchbook images idea because they've liberated me from the notion of purpose other than practice. Now, if you're fairly new here and you're thinking, sketchbook, this is not a drawing show. Uh, no, by sketchbook, we do, well, we effectively are, are using that sort of uh, that connotation, aren't we? The, uh, the idea of, of um, sketching uh, instead of making a, a masterpiece, just quickly sketching down, you know, your, your picture, your photograph can be a sketchbook image. Yes, sketchbook, says Bob. A practice from the painting and drawing world that makes sense of my drive to make images a study. No other intent needed. So uh, thank you for yet another inspiration, or, or should I say enlightenment, all these years, and now I'm, I'm feeling I'm starting, <laughs> I'm starting at last to get it. And now I hope you enjoy these images from my photo walk in Discovery Green in downtown Houston. Cheers, Bob Demers, Director of Photography and Cinematographer. That is a long title, Bob. I like it, but does it fit on the door? You should have one like mine, Neil James. Must try harder. Um, well, yes, I'm, I'm glad you like the idea of the, uh, the, the sketchbook. Well, it seems that uh, my guest last week, Grant Scott, he also refers to it as sketching, doesn't he? Sketchbook images. Pictures that you wouldn't necessarily put in large 1216s on the wall, or as large 1216s on the wall, but, uh, or 2016s, <laughs> or insert your favourite size here. Um, but yeah, but sketchbooks, just um, images that remind you of where you've been, what you've done, what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've experienced. Sketchbook images. And uh, well, since we mentioned Grant Scott, let's have, some, let's have an inspirational clip, shall we? 
and uh, it makes sense to play something from last week's show. This is this is Grant Scott. As I walked with him, um, we 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 chatted about his career, what he's seen and what he's done, and we walked close to his home in in Gloucestershire. You know, I always used to say when I ran teams on magazines and stuff, um, let's head to the choppy waters because that's where the fun is. You know, I don't want to be becalmed. And I, I think photography lends itself very well to that documentation of the choppy waters. I, I always joke, when I give talks about photography, I always say that it's no big deal. It's capturing light in a box. It just so happens there's lots of different shape boxes. And it's up to you which shape box you choose to use. But if it's just capturing light in a box, how are we going to get anything from that? Well, to get anything from that, I think we have to explore who we are. And that does take us into areas of photography that some people find difficult to deal with or to look at or to understand. And a bit like contemporary art, it can become alienating. But it means something to someone when it was created. And so we can try and travel that road rather than perhaps creating something which is purely aesthetically pleasing for the sake of being aesthetically pleasing, which there's absolutely nothing wrong with. But photography does give us an opportunity to go deeper if we wish. And I think serendipity means that you're constantly increasing the size of your comfort zone. You're not, you know, we, we talk about coming out of your comfort zone. I always talk about increasing the size of your comfort mm. zone. So you kind of remain in a comfort zone-ish, but you're always kind of at the edge. Do you know what I mean? Mm. That's uh, Grant Scott. And uh, always an absolute joy to walk with uh, with Grant, with a real human being out on a photo walk. And I, I do intend to... Let's get through this gate there, Barnes. There we go. Good boy. I do intend to do more of those. And... Uh, Occasionally find some photographers that could uh, also maybe take us on a bit of a, an historical uh, walk uh, with our cameras as well. I'd love to, I'd dearly love to do it uh, in your neck of the woods as well. But Neil, I'm in Australia. Well, hmm, look at me. There's all sorts of places I'd love to travel to to do this. We, we'll need to, uh, can we find a way to do it together? Can we? Come on. Let's get clever with our invention, shall we? I wonder if I can lean on you this week for a, a bit of uh, assistance. Well, I don't know, Neil. If it's about borrowing the 30-foot yacht of the weekend, the answer is no. No, I wouldn't dare. It'd be like a remake of, of a James Cameron blockbuster, but before we'd even got out the harbour. No, this is about sharing the show. Um, we have... Uh, well, there's, there's a good few of you now that listen, and I'm very, very proud and thankful and grateful that you do. But uh, if every single person that's listening today could share the show in uh, somewhere, well, somewhere where you belong in, say, a forum, like a Facebook forum, or maybe emailing a friend or on Flickr or I don't know, you're inventive, you're creative. That's why, that's why you and I get on so well. If everybody could share it just once, this time next week, uh, we'd have uh, an even larger community of those who are emotively close to their, their photography, who like the, the act of making photographs, who find that photography really helps them emotionally. We've talked about meditation, of course, today. Um, so uh, if you could share the show for me in whatever fashion that you find appropriate, I'd be really grateful. Do tell me as well if there's a, if there's a group that you're sharing it in that we could do a... What's the parlance? A shout out for. Uh, then I'd be only too pleased to do that. Maybe it's one of your camera clubs or something like that. Uh, fantastic. Right, part two of my guest, Alex Frederickson. It's been a joy to talk about um, her project that became um, her, her first book. And, um, and in this part of the, the interview, the conversation with her, which of course is supported again by some excerpts from the book, Stories that she's recorded for the book, or written down for the book. This way, Barney, I think he's found a grass snake or something. Come on, this way. Come on, I'm trying to do an introduction to Alex Frederickson's second part. Yes, yeah, so um, so this this particular part, part two, is uh, all about the, the publishing of the book, finding a way to design the book, and various other facets that go along with uh, actually publishing, producing your first book. And I, I hope this that this will be... Um, 
an inspirational listen today for anybody who's been thinking, do you know what, I've, I've been meaning to make a book. Because I think sometimes we think of books as this, this sort of, um, well, you know, these, these fantastic Tashan volumes. Um, I know I've gone to the extreme there. Uh, that we, we love and we, we lovingly, well, we don't let anybody else touch them on our bookshelves, do we? But they don't have to be. Uh, they can be much smaller projects. They can be much, you know, they can be modest uh, projects. And I think you're going to enjoy listening to Alex Frederickson sharing um, her experiences in uh, part two of uh, the story Feet Under the Seat. So, Alex, you, you have this moment in the project where you've, you've had friends and peers suggest there, there was or is a book in this. And we've gone from having fun photographing people's feet under a seat to then collecting and collating their stories to, to now the opportunity to see this work in print. Did you know about self-publishing already then? Or was, because that's, that's, that's the route you chose, isn't it? I did not have one single clue what to do. I didn't know how to um, put a book together. I didn't know anybody who did. So I couldn't really ask, ask anybody, can you help me with this? I was really on my own. But what I did was I watched a video by Sean Tucker about how he produces his books. And that's when I decided that the company who produced his books, which is XYZ, I thought, right, OK, if it's good enough for Sean Tucker, then it's good enough for me. So that's, when, that's how I found my printer. And then I remembered what Sean had said about, it's about how do you choose the images and why? Why should they be included? Why should they not be included? Um, it, that was quite easy for me in terms of no image was included without a story. Yeah. So the, the images that didn't have a story attached, I immediately discarded because I wanted it to be true. And then it was about what order do they come in? How much is this going to cost? How much should I charge for this thing? And my head was just kind of exploding a little bit. But, but you did at least have your stories. Um, h- how many in total are there? Fifty. There are 53 stories in the book, plus a few pages about, uh, there's a little section called Ask Alex where people ask me various little things about what happened and how did I choose this and what did I do that, which is quite fun. Uh, let's rewind just a little bit and talk about the momentum this project took. I know you had a few design issues. I know you had to, to start over at one stage with design and all, all the time you had an option obligation for a, well over 100 back orders just waiting for release date. So there was a lot going on for a project that started as fun. And then this time last year, you got diagnosed with burnout. Do you put that down in, in whole or part to this project that had, well, fairly much consumed your, your waking hours, Alex? So um, it wasn't the book's fault. It wasn't anybody's fault. It was just a, it was just like a perfect storm situation. I didn't know what I was doing with the book. Um, but because the book meant so much to me and so much to all these other people, it was it was an enormous weight on my shoulders to deliver something that people would be happy with and that I would be proud of. And then a friend of mine said, come on, I'm going to buy InDesign and I'm going to help you get this back to life. So without her, I would probably still be sitting there with my ha- head in my hands thinking, where do we go from here? It's dark on the night train and I'm alone in the carriage with the young woman whose gorgeous boots I'm looking at on my camera screen. I see her face reflected in the window, her head resting against the cold glass and her eyes closed. It's been almost an hour since the journey began and I wonder if she's asleep. Closed eyes and an empty carriage mean I have plenty of time to observe her and maybe get a few shots of her feet in different positions. Her feet, however, do not move and I'm starting to wonder how she could possibly hold this position for so long. It must be incredibly uncomfortable. Maybe she's a dancer and used to it. So she produced a new design. Within a month we had something wonderful that was a really, really nice PDF and that got me back talking to the printer. But what I what I didn't realise, and this was like the final knife in the in the whole heart situation, was because of the. Um, I mean, every, everybody knows that everything's got so much more expensive over the last months. The price of paper um, increased by seventy percent in December last year, and again in April this year. So the cost of the book to be printed was almost double. Now imagine my horror when I then came to realise that the money that I had put to one side didn't even cover the printing, never mind, never mind the shipping, because of the horrendous price increase. 
But I thought, well, what can I do except go forward because I'm committed to this book and I'm committed to all the people who have bought it. So I've got, I've got to somehow find a way to do it. So, so what, what did you fall back on? What, what was the idea? What was the plan? So um, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to tell you that I used my rent money to get the books printed. <laughs> and that put me in a little bit of predicament, but what can you do? I, I, I wanted to bring this project in into the, uh, into the final station. I ordered just enough books. I couldn't afford to order one more book than I needed. So everything is just so finely tuned. Yeah, but, but, it, but it's here now, isn't it? And the exciting thing is, you can buy it as an e-book and, and you are planning to print more. And we'll have details on the show page today about all this. I, I, wonder, I wonder what you've learned about yourself, Alex, as a, as a photographer during this experience. Oh, my God. What I've learned about myself as a photographer is to look in places that I would never have thought of to look. Not to do the same as everything, uh, same as anybody else is doing. Because I've always, I've always admired street photographers and thought, wow, I'd love to do that, but I can't do that. So what I've learned is that I can do it, but in a different way. I can make a story from something that nobody else would probably think of photographing, and and that's partly because of the restrictions placed upon me. And I think sometimes when you're under those kind of restrictions, then it's like a it's like a dandelion growing in concrete. You find your way to the surface somehow. You're not growing in, in in soil, so it's not easy. But you you want to find what you want to find, so you're looking around and fighting your way through. And that was the first thing. And then obviously the rest of it is about pushing on despite the adversities because of the fact that you're committed to the project and committed to the people who are on the journey with you. It's a fairly warm afternoon and the sun makes frequent appearances, flooding the carriage with bright light, too intense for a photo really. I wait for a moment for more even light, all the time observing her. She's listening to music and jiggling her feet. Her hands are placed on her lap and everything I see and feel tells me this lady is relaxed and looking forward to wherever she's going. I see the thick book beside her and wonder what it is. A textbook of some kind, perhaps. Is she a student? But you know, as curious as I am to where she's heading with a suitcase in a pandemic, sometimes we don't need to know things about people. The many unanswered where, what, why questions aren't that important. And that's Alex Fredericksen talking about uh, Feet Under the Seat, her uh, first book uh, project. And I'll have all the details as to how you can get hold of a copy yourself. And it's a truly international thing, by the way. So wherever you're listening, um, uh, Alex is prepared with the, uh, the the second release of the book to make that work. And uh, there's also information, of course, to, to how you can download the book as, as well. So my thanks, my sincere thanks to Alex Fredrickson for being our guest uh, this week. And, uh, well, that's almost about it for this week. Uh, for links to uh, the f- photographers that you've heard about today and the subjects that we've talked about, and of course to see the pictures that have been made for the photo walk by those writing in, please go to the show page uh, today and you'll find that all there. Some terrific work this week. Well, it's terrific work every single week, but uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll love what you find this week. We haven't made a lot of photographs this week, you and I. Well, I haven't. You have. You've been great. I've been a little less productive today with my camera. Another note to self in the uh, must-do-better stakes for next week. Right, we need a play-out song. I'll tell you what's on the Moore show in a moment, but we need a a play-out song, don't we? It's coming from uh, Straight White Teeth. There's a there's a cracking name for a for a band. It's a kind of well, I think this is a kind of um, a summer's love song with a sun streaming through the window onto my alarm keypad. See, you shoehorned that one in, didn't you, Neil? Yes, in a sort of cyclic fashion from nearer the start of the show. Um, but a PS for the show today comes from Paul Strand. Um, let's, let's try our new friend so you know who Paul Strand is. Hey, Iris, who's Paul Strand? Paul Strand was one of the greatest and most influential photographers of the 20th century whose images have defined the way fine art and documentary photography is understood and practiced today. See? It works. (laughs) And I love this quote from Paul Strand. Very straightforward, very straight thinking, no messing about. Paul said, I go and get the camera and do it. 
photography is a medium in which if you don't do it, then very often you don't do it at all because it doesn't happen twice. Amen to that as we play out with straight white teeth. of straight white teeth and that's it for this week my thanks to alex frederickson chris burkard charlie Waite, and grant scott and joseph marinus actually to mpb.com and those who are patrons which you can join through the link on the website photographydaily.show and for those wonderful supporters who are thank you tomorrow is the more show it's your own weekend oasis of a little extra for your kind support and we're going to be talking about the greatest creative present I ever received. It is analog, but it's not necessarily something you can make pictures with. It's been a while, but I I want to guide you to some more photographic websites you may not have visited. And a, a photo book arrived from Hegard the Dane, which is completely in Danish. I can't understand a word. Translated, the book is called Outside Rush Hour, and I think there is much to be said for a book where you have to really study the pictures to learn what it has to say. Next Friday, I'm going to be talking to Alex Kilby, whose YouTube channel, A Photographic Eye, is a welcome relief from the kit fest that seems to devour the internet's favourite TV channel. I'll be talking to Alex about the photographers he teaches about, the reactions he has had from those he features unexpectedly. Why or how you can change your career direction and become a YouTuber. And what happened when he just shut his photographic business that he'd had for years. And I'd been talking with her about the studio and she was like, so you're going to stay open? I said, oh, I don't know. But I knew in my head that this was, I'd gone, this, this is it. Yeah. Music today is from the wonderful artslist.io. Links and further research will be on the show page today. My thanks to Neil Ford, Emily Renier and Andrea Gilpin for your help behind the scenes. And I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you next time. We've heard, uh, we've heard plenty of aeroplanes in the sky on today's show, but uh, no trains. That is because I'm recording it on National Train Strike Day, day two of three. And we're just coming up to the, uh, the railway crossing here. There's a red light to the left and a red light to the right. Absolutely nothing to see today, Barney. He's pulling me so hard now. I want to get home. It's tea time. It's tea time. He's found a new favourite tea. Barney, come here. Barney, come and say hello. This way. Must I? Yeah, come on. Come and say hello. Oh, don't be like that. Liver. Loves liver. Oh, Neil. Oh, couldn't stand it. 
My mum had a way of cooking liver. Um, it was usually uh, of a style where you could uh, you could probably roll it up and serve it as tennis balls at Wimbledon. It was that rubbery, it was that bouncy. Sorry, mum, he says, looking in the sky. Come on, Barnes, let's go home. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.